Okay, thank you very much um, for the opportunity to um, speak with you today. Um, on my in my presentation, I'm going to be discussing briefly uh, the clinical signs that we see with avian influenza and also some key aspects uh, regarding fire security. So when we consider the clinical signs of uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza, these can actually be quite variable. And it's variable uh, depending upon the type of uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza, but it also is dependent upon um, the species of poultry um, that are infected. So for example, waterfowl in the main tend to be more resilient to clinical signs, whereas turkeys are much more susceptible. If you look at the internet, you'll often see pictures of, um, uh, of uh, avian influenza. And uh, in those pictures, the general picture you'll see is very, very high mortality, as we can see here in this uh, turkey shed in the top left-hand side, where a vast majority of the turkeys uh, are found suddenly dead. Uh, and, the, and in the picture down on the right hand, right, bottom right hand side of your screen, we've got uh, uh, an aviary system. And again, very, very high mortality. Um, some birds um, may be seen to be um, um, still alive, but um, are often very, very, very sick. Other signs that we'll see are um, depressed birds um, and birds looking hunched, feathers up, as we can see in these turkeys on the right hand side of the picture. Um, but again, the key issue, the key uh, clinical sign we see with uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza is high mortality. Cyanosis, which is um, this reddening that we're seeing on the legs or on the wattles uh, and a comb of birds. And sometimes we'll see um, swollen heads uh, in, in birds with avian influenza. These pictures are actually taken from um, a hobby flock that was affected uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and in this case, we can see this, um, this bird has got very swollen wattles. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's also got a swollen head and, and it was clearly very depressed um, prior to um, actually dying. So in summary, the uh, clinical signs of uh, avian, inf avian influenza can be quite variable. But the key things we tend to see are birds have lost appetite. So there's inappetence, there's increased mortality. You'll see a lot of depressed, sick birds. There may be coughing and sneezing. There may be diarrhea. There may be swollen heads and wattles. And in egg layers, often we'll see depression of egg production. And the egg color, the egg shell color may be affected. So uh, instead of laying um, a brown egg, for example, those, there may be a, a greater preponderance of, of, of paler eggs, uh, egg shells. Um, egg production is almost certainly going to drop in uh, egg layers. And occasionally there'll be uh, other signs like nervous signs. So the birds will maybe see, be seen staggering or they may be, um, uh, have twisted necks. Um, or showing other nervous signs. So it's rather confusing in some respects. The clinical picture is not necessarily specific for um, uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza. And I think the key message here is if you have an unexplained mortality or egg production drop, then it's important to consult a specialist poultry veterinarian and or the animal plant and health agency. It's far better to report and get advice than harbor disease and potentially spread it to other poultry keepers. I'm now going to talk briefly about biosecurity because there's no other preventative strategies for avian influenza uh, in this country than biosecurity. But there's a real positive aspect to biosecurity in that if you have good biosecurity, it's a good strategy for preventing a host of other diseases uh, entering your flock. So as, as a, a responsible owner, ensuring your biosecurity is robust is really, really important. Now, there are, very, there are various ways that biosecurity can become breached and disease can enter a flock. But the two key areas that I want to focus on are people and wild birds. So looking at some aspects of best practice as far as biosecurity is concerned. 
The first thing is to limit the number of visitors to the site. Keep these to a minimum, and it's really important to maintain a visitor's book. And this is an example of a visitor's book where we can see the date, the name of the visitor, the contact number of that visitor, did they enter the bird area or not, the company they work for. Um, and what we ask them to do is to record the previous poultry site they went to and the next poultry site they're likely to go to, their vehicle registration number, and if they come onto the site, whether their wheels have been disinfected and then recording time in and time out. And this is really important information should at some point your site become an infected premises because this allows the animal plant and health um, um, agency uh, epidemiologist to actually work back and find out potential dangerous contacts to, your infect to an infected site. Other aspects of biosecurity, the sorts of biosecurity that we see in the commercial sector is ensuring that people have protective clothing, dedicated protective clothing to the site, uh, foot dips and boot changes, um, hand washing and hand sanitizers. So this is really a key aspect in terms of uh, preventing infection being carried onto site by visitors. Just showed a picture here of some pole barn turkeys. Um, and again, where we, see, where we see here, these birds are actually enclosed. Um, they have uh, um, open sides, but the sides are uh, actually covered with um, um, mesh to prevent wild bird, wild bird access. Looking at free-range turkeys, this is an example of free-range turkeys where the turkeys are allowed outside. One of the things that um, um, I would say is not so good about this particular picture is the fact that we've got uh, pooled water on the range. Pool water is always a risk because there's an opportunity to uh, invite wild waterfowl to come onto site. They love um, puddles in which they can dabble, and wild waterfowl are a real risk factor as far as the carriage of avian influenza. This uh, is an example of good turkey biosecurity on a free range site in pole barns. There's a good area of um, uh, prior to, um, to the entrance into the sheds with um, um, uh, covering of the, uh, of the ground there with uh, metal plates. And in this particular example, we have a, sh a, a small um, a shed that's been inserted into the door of the, uh, po um, uh, the, um, uh, the polytunnel. Um, and when we look inside that, what we've got in there is we've got uh, dedicated um, site clothing and we've also got dedicated boots and a foot dip so the uh, operators can put that protective clothing on before they enter into the pole barn, um, um, uh, sorry, into the um, polytunnel and actually service the turkeys. An example of um, what I would call good game bird biosecurity on this particular site, um, you come up to the site, there's a gate so you don't, people don't automatically enter the uh, bird area. We've got um, boots, dedicated boots outside, which the operators can uh, or visitors can put on. There's a foot dip there. And then there's also um, uh, hand sanitizers, again, before they enter the site. And when you go onto the site, um, the dedicated rearing huts here, we have foot dips um, before, the, um, uh, before the visitors can actually go into the, uh, into the rearing building. If we turn to smallholder best practice, again, the same messages are there, which is minimize visitors, keep a record of visitors onto the site. Ideally, don't mix bird species, especially, especially waterfowl with other, other, other poultry species. And the main reason for that is that if you have waterfowl, there is a, a chance that they could call in wild waterfowl. Obviously, having calling ducks is a, is a, is a way of attracting in wild birds. And, and we want to avoid that. We want to avoid that potential mixing of domestic species with wild species. Don't provide feed out on the range. So the example on the left-hand side here, we've got a range with a variety of bird species. Not ideal because, again, it's a variety of bird species, but there's no outdoor feeding, which is a good thing. If you do feed outside, then perhaps you could um, uh, have these uh, feeders, covered feeders. So this particular feeder system, the birds actually operate it, they step on the plate, 
opens it up and they can have access to feed. And this again minimizes the risk of food being available to attract wild waterfowl on site. It's important to clear up feed spillages and this picture on the left hand side shows some feed spillage I saw on a, on a site. Um, there was no, it hadn't been cleared up and this was a key attracting in for wild birds. Wild, bird, wild corvids were actually coming in and actually picking up this, um, uh, this food material. And again, there's a risk of bringing that in and bringing it close to your own domestic birds. Avoid open water. Um, a very simple system, nipple system here, put in a, a, a hobby farmer um, flock. Uh, again, avoids pooling of water and a pools, uh, avoids attracting wild waterfowl into that area where you have the domestic poultry. So again, avoid open water. And in this particular picture, again, picked up off the internet, shows wild water, wild water, uh, uh, it's not wild waterfowl, waterfowl, ducks, uh, alongside chickens with a pond. This is a complete no-no in terms of um, uh, biosecurity for avian influenza. So in summary, a couple of take-home messages from my presentation. Firstly, if you're in doubt, regarding any clinical signs in your birds, seek professional help from a specialist poultry veterinarian or the animal plant and health agency. And simple biosecurities will minimize the risk of avian influenza or incursion onto site. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Daniel. Um, so we have, uh, as you'd expect, a, a number of questions that have come in. We're not going to be able to answer them all now, but two for you, Daniel. The first one is, what do you mean by eggshell color change? And the second one was, the second one was, if you spot signs of bird flu in your flock early, what are the chances of the birds recovering? Okay, so to answer the first question, uh, in terms of egg color, um, egg color again can be quite variable. Um, but one is, is one of the signs that we see with avian, avian influenza, both low path and also high path. And it's just the impact of the sickness on the bird affects the shell color. So uh, as I say, a normal brown egg, you probably likely see more paler eggs um, arising. Now, that's not pathognomonic for avian influenza. It can be caused by a number of other diseases as well, but it is often a sign that we see. In terms of um, recovery, um, I think with um, highly pathogenic avian influenza, it's highly unlikely that they're either going to recover um, if they become infected. But more importantly, if we identify it, then what is, is uh, you know, the action that's going to be taken is to is a stamping out uh, procedure. So the flock will be depopulated. Uh, and that's in the best interest of all poultry keepers, because what we must do, mustn't do is we mustn't allow avian influenza to become um, um, uh, to, to become established in the country and then the risk of onward spread through other factors rather than direct incursions from wild waterfowl. Uh, 